with Frank Napolitano and Paul Rushforth. Here is Steve Gregory. Oh, I thought it was going to be late today. I was putting the patio furniture out. Seriously. Isn't it nice out? Beautiful out there. Just gorgeous. I mean, it, there's nowhere on earth that is a better temperature than Ottawa right no, now. No, Nowhere on earth. Nowhere. But I can tell you one thing. For the first time in a long time, I'm looking across the studio and I don't have to look at Frank. I, I get to look at Greg, a much better looking dude than Frank. Oh, thanks, Paul. <laughs> oh, Frank, you're there. Thank you. I was, oh, Frank, I gave, you, I gave you a big window to jump in there, yeah. buddy. <laughs> he didn't want to interrupt me for the first time. Up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. What parking lot do we find you in today, Frank? <laughs> you find me in a parking lot in beautiful downtown Cape Coral. Nice, in Florida. Awesome. Yeah. So temperature there, I same am. as here? Uh, well, it's beautiful there, no question. I mean, I, all I got is dated with text yesterday. You picked the wrong week to go away, and clearly I did. But it's 26 and sunny here, so a little bit better here. Oh, I'll t- shut up. I'll take that. I'll take the 26 and <laughs> yeah. sunny over our, what are we, 10 degrees, 11 degrees yesterday. It was beautiful. Yeah, record. Yeah. For February? Listen, for February, this is incredible. But it's scary. It's, it's scary because with this global warming, what do you think our summers is going to be like this year? I mean, we're, first of all, we're going to have an early spring. We're already seeing that. I'm assuming most of our snow will be gone um, very shortly. Um, now, I'm sure we're going to get another dump of snow, but it's been it's been a beautiful February. I mean, well, the gopher said early spring, so I believe him. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Now, does weather like this twerk people a little bit? Just- well... It does. It does. Right. Anytime you, you, it, the weather's nice and the snow's starting to melt and people see some, you know, that we're heading into that spring market and we're heading into the summertime, they get that optimism. And we're, we're seeing it right now in the market. It's our market is just it's just inches away from bursting. You can just feel it. I mean, we're listing a ton of homes. Um, we're selling a ton of homes. There's lots of multiple offers going on again. We're finding though, that the multiple offers aren't like what we went through for COVID when it was, you know, a hundred, 200, a thousand dollars over asking. We're seeing multiple offers, but I think the biggest one I've seen that we've done recently was maybe 10, 15, maybe 20,000 over asking, which is kind of a normal Ottawa market back in the day when, you know, sometimes a bidding war would be list price or 5,000 over. So I think that's where we're headed. I, I think the days of the hundred and two hundred thousand over asking are probably gone. But um, but it's it's just, I hope so. Yeah, yeah, and, and so do I. It was I, I found the hardest thing that we had to do is when someone called us and said, "Hey, can we go take a look at your listing at you know one two three ABC Street?" We'd have to go there and show them the listing, try to build that rapport and trust with these people who have never met us before. And then once they say, "Oh, we like it," can we put an offer? And I say. Okay, the house is listed at seven hundred. If you really want this house, you're going to have to go to nine fifty. And it, it, you come across as that slimy yeah, salesman exactly. telling people they yeah. got to go two hundred and fifty over asking. But you know, sometimes we had to let the people have their process and lose out on a few until they said, "Oh, I should be listening to you." And then you don't, you know. And people did <laughs> lose out on a lot. <laughs> yeah, we had we had some agents who had buyers who were quite grumpy, even though they did everything right. They were going in firm. They did an inspection before going. Um, they're going 200 over asking on a firm deal and they lose out by, you know, 50 grand. Yeah. But some people lost three, four, five homes. Absolutely. And that's where we ran into trouble with, you know, we're not going to worry about financing. We're not going to worry about inspection. Yeah. And, and, you know, everyone says, oh my God, to be a realtor in that market must be simple. Well, not as if you're you're listing. Well, if you're, if you're (laughs) list, but, but even listing the homes, I'd always say, you know, they'd have all these different different models out there who would, you know, say, list with us, it's cheap, you know, we'll, we'll do it for cheap. And, but there was a difference between getting 10,000 over asking and a hundred thousand over asking, navigating 30 offers rather than just 10. And, you know, so we, we were still doing our job on the list side, getting people the max amount of dollar, but it was on the buy side that was really tricky, you know, trying to, you know, trying to almost corral your buyers and, you know, deal with their disappointment if they did lose out on one. And we had lots of people losing out on them, uh, even with competitive offers. So it was really, really difficult to deal with buyers back in that, that COVID COVID era. Uh, I, I just think a market like this is much easier for everyone. Yes. A realtor has to sharpen their skills and be really good at what they do, which is what, what we get paid for and what we should get paid for. But it's just, it's trying to navigate and do the best for your buyers and your sellers in a market like this is, in my opinion, much easier than trying to do it in that crazy COVID market. Now, one of the things I read recently was that showings were up 
a lot yeah. in the last month. People weren't necessarily closing, but showings were up a lot. So the interest is there. The interest is there. We're already seeing people coming off the coming off the fence and and getting involved. Uh, you know, I'll let Frank talk to this, but you know, they did. There's, there's a lot of reports and announcements that that it is almost a, a guarantee that they are going to be lowering rates in the June announcement. Uh, which I'll let Frank touch on, but I, I, I think that right there, just saying that's what's going to happen, gives people a lot of optimism right now. To that, that you listen, it's and there was there was actually a, a report in the Globe and Mail was it two days ago, basically saying that uh, Canadians and, and not just Ottawa but Canadians are really starting to panic about getting into the market now because they think it's going to take off again. So they're seeing... Yeah, they figure four months from now, as soon as that announcement is made. It could be too late, right? You could be sitting here in June saying, damn, I wish I would have listened to Paul in March and February and and January because... In 2002. In 2002, (laughs) I said the same thing. But but no, it's it's, when when the market's about to take off, you can feel it. Like you can just feel it. It's about to take off. And that's why I'm saying to people, I know the rates suck. But they are going to get better. Get into the market as soon as you can. You're starting to have more opportunity and more choice. We're starting to list a lot of homes. I mean, Greg's sending out pretty much a couple texts a day with all the pictures of the listings he's doing. And it's it, it's coming. It's coming. And I'm saying get in the market if you can. Get Would those there. rates have come down sooner, Frank, if we hadn't added 37,000 new jobs? Again, let's look at the details of the 37,000 jobs. So I, This is Frank's favorite group. topic. I love this. <laughs> Our population grew by 126,000. So let's, again, deeper look into these job numbers really tell you a different story. On top, the 37,000, really good. But again, our population grew by 126,000. So once you put that into the equation, it's not so good. Look at what the parent company of the radio station we're on right now, what they did this week. Uh, everywhere we're reading, we're not reading about companies hiring hundreds and thousands of people were reading more about even in the u.s as, as good as the economy is here uh again it's a lagging effect and i truly believe that these job numbers will be reflective soon enough this gives the government an opportunity to boast that the unemployment came down to 5.7 but the other fact that's there is that a lot of people just have given up on getting a job that they're interested in so um again the job numbers are what they are but what it will do is it will delay again i i, I was uh, skeptical that April was going to be the first uh, drop, but I don't think it's going to be. I think it's going to be in June, and it's right now they have it at about ninety percent for a rate cut in June. So, and so, I, I think they're going to be probably very conservative in June with a rate rate drop, maybe quarter point. Well, according to the economists, now oh, the forecasts are that for the entire year they're not going to come down anywhere near what they thought they were going to. Is that what you're reading, Frank? I, no, I'm still reading. Most of them are saying anywhere between three quarters of a percent to one, with the majority of it obviously happening in the second half of the year. You know, most of them think that we'll see that quarter percent cut in June. Then after that, we'll start to see them a little bit more um, quicker. So I don't think they're going to be aggressive. We probably won't see. The only way we'll see a half percent cut is if the job numbers are horrible, inflation gets to two percent, GDP is horrible. That's when we'll see it. But the truth is that I think. You know, a lot of the politicians that are out there are just, they're just not paying attention to what's going on in the real world. And that's what's scary for many Canadians, because, you know, for for everything you read about all these jobs, how many of these jobs are people getting a part-time job that already have a full-time job? That's not good for the economy. And that's what's happening here in the U.S. that they're not talking about. They're talking about all the jobs that have been added. What they're forgetting to talk about is the fact that a lot of people are getting part-time jobs because... I went to the grocery store here, and guys, I feel it's even more expensive here than it is back home, and everybody thinks everything's cheaper here, and beer's cheaper, alcohol is cheaper, gas is cheaper, but bread, milk, the necessities are uh, actually, with the exchange rate, they're more expensive here than they are in Canada. Beer, gas, and what else is cheaper? <laughs> beer, gas, and alcohol. And you said there's, here. and you said the other things are the necessities. <laughs> <laughs> hey Frank, just before just before we go to break, uh, 
Listen, I know Kathy's sending me, your lovely wife is sending me pictures of you guys on vacation to make me jealous on that, but tell her to stop with the pictures of you in the thong. Please, please, please. Uh, yeah, not Every, a chance. <clears throat> everything, Frank was having a great time until four members of Greenpeace tried to roll him back in the water. 521 <laughs> 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 Talk, 521 8255. We'll be right back. Welcome back with Paul Rushforth and Frank Napolitano. To the phones we go, say hello to Ron. Hello, Ron. Yes, I have a question for Paul on the commission on a million dollar home, $50,000. How is that split up between the real estate agent and the broker? Well, it all depends on what split you're on in a company. Uh, different companies have different splits. Some people have you know more, more heavier splits to the company. Some people have heavier splits to the to the but, agent. But how much goes to um, the listing agent and how much goes to the buying agent? Well, no, I think what he's asking is how does the broker split it with the agent? Is that what you're asking, Ron? Uh, no, uh, the the buying and the selling uh, is that split four ways. No, it's split. So it's split two ways. So when 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 we go to list a property, whatever we charge, we usually give half of that to the an, another agent in the city, a buyer agent, to bring us a buyer. Yeah. Um, and like I said, commissions are, are negotiable, uh, as well as buyer commissions are negotiable. Uh, and then obviously everyone has a split with their brokerage, and it all depends on if you're on a team, if you're in a brokerage, uh, if you're working independently. It all depends on that. But but usually the commission is split between the buying agent and the selling agent. Fifty fifty. It's usually fifty fifty. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ron. Wow. No, there's there's that was easy. It is split four ways though. The guy is right. Uh, you know, the caller is right because the brokerage, the listing brokerage, yep. gets a piece as well as the listing agent, and then the the uh, the selling brokerage will get a piece as well as a selling agent. So yeah. And if you're, if you are sort of a solo agent working for a, another half, right. A, another company, you would have a, it all depends on what company you work for. All companies have different splits. Like I said, some people are, some splits are maybe the brokerage gives them a little bit more. So they take a little bit more, uh, and other companies they don't do the brokerage doesn't do much. So they give more of the money to the agent. Uh, but yeah, he's right when they say that they, it's, it's two ways, but you do have a split with your brokerage once you once you do split that commission. Yes. Hey, the real estate agent has to be with the brokerage, right? I mean, it, it's no different in the with the mortgage business. There has to be a mortgage brokerage that a mortgage agent works for. And and you know, as much as we call ourselves, a lot of us call ourselves mortgage brokers. The true, we're really mortgage agents. The only ones that are mortgage brokers are the ones that take you know uh, much more education to become and have the ability to open up a brokerage. So, yeah. and the same same uh, in real estate, where everyone's yeah. this, everyone gets their sales rep. Um, license, and then if you want to become a broker, and some people get their broker license and never even open up their own brokerage. Use it. Yeah, like I yeah. mean, I obviously had to get my brokerage license or my broker's license because I wanted to open up my own brokerage. Boy, it must have been easy to pass then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll tell you what, though. They've done a very good job of making the courses a lot harder now. They are much more difficult, much aren't they? more difficult. I mean, don't get me wrong. When I went through uh, real estate college in, well, real estate school in 2003, it was still fairly challenging, but it was open book as well. So you're allowed to use your book. Um, but there was a lot, lot more writing, less true and false. Whereas now you have to go through Humber college. It takes longer. Um, it's, it's much harder. And I think they did that on purpose because there was so many people wanting to get into real estate. And if, if it was such an easy course, everyone would be in real estate, but which they were at one point, which they were at one point, but now they've made the the course much harder. And you'll see some people who want to get into real estate, they take their phase one, they don't pass. And they're like, you know what? I'm, I'm out. And so they've, they're starting to weed out people who aren't serious about being a, a, you know, a a full-time realtor. And and it's, it's not a bad thing what they're doing. I think it's, it's good. Funny thing is after taking that entire course, if I want a job with you, I still have to learn more. Well, yes. So if you join my brokerage, the course teaches you certain things and doesn't teach you certain things. And I think some of the things that they don't teach you are absolute necessities in, in real estate. Things like, you know, they don't teach you how to set up a website and how to do marketing and advertising and how to negotiate and all that. And those are really important things. Well, so especially negotiations. Especially negotiations. I, I even find role playing and scripts and dialogues and, and, and things like that that they don't really teach you. And so like when you join my brokerage, I spend most of my time working on sales skills, language. Uh, Angie, my office manager, goes through technology because it's not my strongest suit. So I'll do the sales and the, the language and the skills training, and then she'll do all the technology and our systems and all that. But there's a lot to learn. Even when you get your license, there's a lot to learn, no matter what brokerage you join. Hey, Frank, tell me if these numbers surprise you. I was a bit surprised by this. The price for a townhouse last month, 
down 2.1% to 462.2. And the condo up 3.7 to 418.5. That's not much of a gap that 418.5 to 462.2. Yeah, so I would make me, maybe Paul can answer this, but is it because certain townhouses sold in certain areas where, where maybe that number got skewed a little bit? Yes and no. So the condo market, I mean, I think when you're thinking of a condo, you're thinking of just like a small little terrace home that a track builder built. Keep in mind, there's a lot of nice downtown penthouses, you know, overlooking parliament, things like that, that really bring up that condo number. But you're right. It, it is, the gap is really starting to shrink between the condo market and the, and the townhouse market. We're seeing townhouses are a tougher sell now. One, there's a lot more option on the market right now, and especially in some new su- suburbs where there's lots of new builders in there. So that's bringing down the price of townhomes for sure. And I think the condo market, we're seeing a lot more high-end condos being built, and that's bringing up the price of the condo market. It's an interesting shift, though, because it used to be so close between single-family homes and townhomes, yeah. like two years ago, it was, you know, if you wanted to downsize, there was really no gain financially. Well, when we were going through the COVID market, when things were going stupid and townhomes were selling for, you know, in the sevens and the eights. Yeah. People are like, yeah, so I'm going to take my 2,500 square foot home, which I, I'm probably going to get a million dollars for, and I'm going to go buy an $800,000 smaller townhouse. And they're like, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, if it was a $600,000 townhome and a million dollar, that single family home, that's a big difference. That's a bigger spread. So we're starting to see that open up a little bit now where single family homes are going up a little bit, townhomes are going down a little bit. So it's, it's allowing people to downsize now. Yeah. So townhomes are closer to condos, yeah. whereas before they were closer to single the closer, family homes. Yeah, they were. They were. And and I think the the, the one of the biggest reasons that the townhouse market is is shrunk a little bit is because there's a lot of new home building going on in the city, even though there's not enough new home building, but there still is a lot of new home builders. When you think of all the major builders in the city and then think of all the new areas, when you think of the, you know, Riverside South, the Finley Creeks, the Canadas, the Orleans, where a lot of the young families are living, that's where they're building. I mean, builders make more money building a row of townhomes than they do a couple singles, right? So they, they like the high density homes, especially with the way the prices are going. You, a lot of people can only afford a high density home. So what's happening is the builders, that's the product they're building. So there's a little bit of a glut of those on the market. I mean, I say we're, we're, we don't have enough homes on the market, but we definitely have enough townhomes on the market. Really? So yeah, yeah, we do. We do. There's some areas of the city that are really getting hurt with the townhome market. And then there's others, you know, more of the older areas uh, where there's not as much on the market. Are, it's, a, it's an easier sell in those areas right now than it is in, in, in suburbia. So are we almost townhomes favor buyers now? Um, I would say buyers have a lot of selection when it comes to townhomes. So yes, I mean, if, uh, if, if, if we're talking about anything in a balanced market in some areas, a buyer's market, we're usually looking at a townhome market. You know, that's, that's where we're seeing more balanced market out there. And like I said, some areas we're seeing a a buyer's market for townhomes for sure. Frank, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, Paul, uh, but new builders aren't starting their townhouses in the fours. I mean, I would think they're in the fives and sixes, aren't they? Yeah. So right now, a lot of builders have have shrunk down from advertising, you know, townhomes in the sevens to now I've seen some builders and some very reputable builders that are now starting at like 579, 589 for a brand new three bed, three bath, 1800 square foot townhome. So we've seen those prices come down where most builders, most builders were in the sevens during sort of that COVID climb. Frank, speaking of builders, are you having people knocking on your door that, <clears throat> excuse me, had a deal to buy a home that was just completed and because they made that deal early on and these rates are going crazy, they need help? We still do, unfortunately. And, and, and the, you know, the predicament they're caught in is the fact that they may have bought in that townhouse, like Paul said, in the seven. So they may have bought it for 700000 but today it's appraised at six fifty. So therefore, they need to come up with that difference because the lender will only lend on the lower of the appraised value of the property as of today versus the purchase agreement. So that's where a lot of buyers and I've had builders call me and say, like, what can they do? And if if they were in this with 5% down, they're in trouble. Someone who's purchased with 20% down, all of a sudden they got to get default insurance and qualify with 5% down because unfortunately, again, we're going to go with the lower amount. So um, it, it's tough because people feel like they've been duped. That being said, if we all recall, you know, anybody that bought a townhouse or bought a home from a builder in 2019, 2020, uh, also gained tremendously because they were getting those, those homes at maybe 
you know, 60% uh, value based on the fact that, you know, they may have bought it for 600, but all of a sudden it's appraising at 900 a million when they get the, the keys to it. So I remember there was this big builder in Orleans and this is just before the market started to go crazy. This big builder in Orleans. I walked into their show center one day and I was like, Oh, I'm just, just checking out prices in the area. They said, yeah, but our townhomes were, were selling those for, you know, anywhere from 460 to 485. And I looked at the sales rep and I laughed at her. I said, what? I said, how stupid is that? The, You're the, never going to get that. You'll never get that. The <laughs> resale market was only at like 350 for a townhome at the time. And I walked in about four months later. I'm like, I guess I'm the idiot. <laughs> I was wrong because <laughs> they were getting that. And then before long, they were in the fives, then the sixes, then the sevens. And it's like, holy Crap, and now what? Back into the sixes again? Now we're well, like I said, some builders are five seventy nine yeah. to five ninety nine, some in the low sixes, and it's yeah, they have definitely come back downhill for sure. So now we got when we come back, I want to talk about this window for the next four months. Yeah, gonna Big have time. to make a decision here. Yeah. Five two one talk five two one eight two five five. We'll be right back. Welcome back with Frank DiPolitano and Paul Rushforth. This is Steve Gregory. All right, so if we figure rates are going to be coming down in four months, yep. Now we have a decision to make about whether we buy. Before the rates come down and there's a possible jump into the market by a lot of people who are waiting for that, yeah. or do you wait? I think the optimism of even talking about it, and like like Frank said, 90% chance we're dropping rates in June. Well, you know, as long as nothing in the economy changes too much between now and June, it's, it's, it's a slam dunk that we are going to be coming down. People already know about that. So it's, it's in the news. People know. People are already getting that frenzy. And like you said, showing times is showing that showings are way up on properties. Um, and it, 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 that's a telltale sign. People are looking right now. So I, I figure that once we get that rate drop, uh, the optimism is going to go through the roof. Uh, you know, they're going to obviously be dropping again um, later in the year, sometime in the fall, we sometime hope, in yeah. the summer, we hope. And then I think by that point, it's potentially too late. Like we're already going to see, I mean, I talked in 2021 at the end of the year, October, November, December, I remember saying, now I, I'll never lie and say I saw it coming, but I knew the market was going to go because there was just so much pent up demand. I knew the market was going to go a little bit crazy, not as crazy as it did, but I was telling people in those months, buy, 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 get in now because come Jan, Feb, March, it's going to go insane. And we saw the average sale price climb over a hundred thousand dollars in four months. And by then people were like, uh, too late. Right. So I, I figure you may want to stomach the rates. Like I've been saying for a long time, stomach the rates on a, on a short term or on a variable. And if that term is getting shorter now. Yes. And if you can just stomach it and, and get into the market, those rates are coming down and you're going to be buying a house that potentially six months from now is up 30, 40, 50, 60, $70,000. So it's, it's, it's a very, very important that you listen to this. If you're thinking of getting into the market and you're thinking of waiting till let's say summer, you may be too late. You may be too late. I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I just, I see the way. Well, not too late, but you're going to lose out. You're going to lose out. You, yeah, you're not going to be too late, but you, the house that you're going to buy now for, let's say 700 might be 725, 740, <laughs> 7, 735, something like that. So, you know, don't cost yourself extra money. If you know you're going to buy, get in now. Um, you know, if you're not sure if you're going to buy, yeah, I mean, you can wait, but you might be paying a little bit more for a house than, than, than you will right now. Is the difficult part still qualifying, Frank? Uh, of course, because you're, again, the stress test is still in play. So you're qualifying at 2% above. So, so here's an example where it works against the consumer. The best mortgage you can get today, the lowest interest rate you're going to get is on a five-year fixed mortgage. But you know that interest rates are coming down. So ideally, you really don't want to lock into a five-year. Ideally, even though it's, it might be higher, you might take a variable rate mortgage because it's going to keep more money in your pocket long term. Short term will cost you more. But the problem is, if you take a variable rate mortgage and you were to get six and a quarter percent on a variable, then you got to qualify at eight and a quarter. Versus if you took a five year fix today, which is in the five percent range, you got to qualify at seven. And for some people, they qualify at seven, but they don't qualify at eight and a quarter. So they're forced to take a five year and then kick themselves a year from now when the five year rate might be down to three something. Now, can That's I ask you a stupid question, Frank? Why would you have to qualify higher at a variable rate if you could lock in at any time? doesn't make sense. I didn't say it made sense. I, I didn't say I agree with it. But unfortunately, every mortgage qualifies at whatever you get on your contract plus 2%. There is no ends of surbut. So they have a mortgage qualifying rate of five and a quarter percent, which is really does no good to anybody because there's no way that 
or even using that rate. So that's, that's the lowest someone can qualify at. But it's the lowest of that or the higher, or, or sorry, it's the higher of that rate or your contract rate plus two. So that so it doesn't work out for the Well, consumer. yeah, where, where the rates are, it's always going to be the contract plus two, right? Always, always. Yeah. That's why that qualifying rate is there for nothing. They might as well just eliminate it because it doesn't apply to anybody right now. Yeah, that that applied when they brought that in. That was great when the rates were in the twos, but you know now that it made yeah. sense. It made then, sense. Right? It yeah. made sense then because yeah, they're making people qualify as if the rates were that high. And you know, in some circumstances, maybe that was smart. But but now that number that number is useless it, it, it now. Was. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't agree I, with you. We gave them credit. We said for for what we went through at that time frame, <clears throat> that qualifying rate made absolute sense. Where it doesn't make sense. Is today because if if the if the belief system is that the rates have peaked, then there's no need to add two percent to the contract rate if they peak. Because the whole purpose of this is to protect consumers in the future when their mortgage comes up for renewal to make sure that they qualify at the higher rates. Yeah. So, what would you like to see happen, Frank? Well, I'd like to see that they're flexible with it, and they and and they actually read the tea leaves, and they read the fact that interest rates are on their way down. So if interest rates are on their way down, why do we have a qualifying rate of plus two? Maybe it's plus a half at this point. Maybe it's plus one to be safe, but at least be able to monitor what's going on and be able to adjust on the fly as opposed to just being hard nosed about it and saying, nope, it's contract plus two. We're not changing it. Or just have a mortgage qualifying rate and set it based on what's going on in the economy, set it based on what's going on with interest rates and what, and what inflation's doing, what the job report's doing. Set it on that and let everybody qualify at that rate so that it's not about contract plus. And then it gives Canadian consumers the option to be able to choose any term they want without having, uh, without being penalized for it. Would it make sense to tie it into prime, make it five plus (laughs) plus a half or whatever? Whatever they decide, to me, I would like to see just a qualifying rate and let the Canadians pick whatever term they want. So, you know, if, if a Canadian feels like, in other words, if somebody's buying a property to fix it and maybe flip it in two years, but they only qualify for the five year, they're going to be set with a heavy penalty to break it once they do this. So, um, again, it penalizes people. Listen, the stress test has done exactly that. It's created stress to many Canadians because many Canadians cannot qualify for traditional mortgages. So, what it's done, it's put Canadians into alternate mortgages and private mortgages. So, Canadians are paying the price for the stress test that's supposed to protect the system, but what it's doing is it's hurting everyday Canadians from from home ownership. I think I think the stress test is taking a lot of optimism and confidence out of first time home buyers, and it's it's sad to see because there's a lot of first time home buyers who'd love to get in, but I mean I've talked to a lot of them, and they're just like I don't think I'm ever going to own a home. Like I just yeah, yeah. don't. I just it, their optimism is just. Through the floor. well, they're talking about young people now. It's going to take twenty two years before they can save twenty percent for a down payment. Yeah, twenty two years. It's wrong. I mean, yeah. I mean, they're taking away the dream. There's a couple of things that they've done, which, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the anti flipping tax either, where you know you you buy a house, you got to keep it for a year, or you're getting dinged on taxes and stuff like that. It uh, yeah, that's entrepreneurship, and right. and you're bringing a better home on the market, right? Like we talked about this, where like yeah, like I, if I want to get ahead in this world. I don't have a pension and stuff like that. How I get ahead is through property ownership and flipping and stuff like that. That's how I, I, I get ahead. And to take away, and a lot of people do, and to take that away. And, and what are you doing when you're flipping a property? You're improving the neighborhood. You're improving the property. You're generating more tax for the, for the government. You're getting people to spend more at, at stores like the, you know, the Ronas and the Home Depots and all that stuff to go get their products and their supplies. It's it's it actually is a good thing for the economy that flipping and so when they brought that in and the stress test I thought it was a it's almost like you know in the states it's you're allowed to get ahead in Canada do you, no you're not allowed to get ahead I had, a, to- I had a thought yesterday you talk about taxes I thought how wonderful would it be to put a limit on land transfer tax like if a property is sold three times or four times. Then there's no more land transfer tax. The yeah. government's got enough money out of that property. Yeah, I mean that's even a stupid one too. Like I think in Quebec they call it the bienvenue tax, like the welcome tax. Like, yeah. hey, welcome, here's yeah. your new house. Give us ten grand. You know, yeah. I always found that uh, that you I mean you're playing property tax anyways. You know, and now you're going to go pay land transfer tax just to transfer your name on, on the title. Like, and and some places, depending on how much the house is, you're paying it huge dollars in land transfer tax, yeah. things like that. I, I wish they would, 
they're they're not making it easy for Canadians to get ahead. That's for sure. Um, and, but if they if they change that land transfer tax, say a home has been sold five times and now there's no more land transfer, that would give people the impetus to buy older homes and fix them up. Yep, it, it would. It would, because most likely an older home has been transferred a few times. And, exactly. And, and and yeah, if you're buying that home, it would make that home more attractive too, knowing that you're saving four, five, six, ten grand on, on land transfer tax. It really would. Yeah. So we got some good ideas, Steve. We don't should be, we, though? We should be running this thing, you know? Like, <laughs> Frank, you're rather quiet on this. You don't agree? This, well, no, but keep in mind, land transfer tax is a provincial thing. So I've got, you know, co-workers that I work with that are in Alberta. In Alberta, there's no such thing. And it's funny because all the lenders are based out of Toronto. So part of the down payment we have to provide them with is closing costs. And generally speaking, most lenders want one and a half to two percent of the purchase price. So if you're buying a house for seven hundred, you got to have fourteen thousand dollars for land for uh, closing costs, which incorporate land transfer tax. In Alberta, there is no land transfer tax. So in Alberta, your legal fees are about twenty five hundred dollars to close on a property. So significantly different closing costs. But, you know, like my co workers in Alberta say, then, you know, the underwriters in Toronto are always saying you don't have enough closing costs. It's like, but we don't have land transfer tax. Why do we have to provide you 2% of the purchase price yeah. when closing costs are $2,500 and that's it? And in Toronto, it's double. Double. They have double the tax. It's double. Yeah. They have two yeah. taxes. Yeah. It's, you know what? It must be hard yeah. to buy in Toronto, eh? With, with all the different taxes and the prices. Yeah. Through their the numbers roof. are way up in January. And, you know, their employment is less than here in Ottawa. We, we are one of the highest, uh, employed, no, not employed, uh, um, household income. Oh, yeah. We, we have one of the highest in the country. And when you look at Toronto, I think ours was uh, household income. I think we averaged 106 or 112,000 for household income. Whereas Toronto, I think was at 97. So Toronto household income is less than here in Ottawa, but their prices are double than what we are in Ottawa. Yeah. And they have double the land transfer tax and. You know, I mean, I don't know about their property tax. It might be less. I have no idea what. I doubt it. Maybe yeah. at least the same. Well, you'd think it'd be at least the same. Yeah. But five two one talk five two one eight two five five. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the phones. We go say hello to Morgan and beautiful Russell. Hello, Morgan. Hey, uh, just taking a look at uh, some houses here in my my neighborhood. I'm in one of them C H Clement builds, looking to move into a uh, single family. Okay. Um, just. Is it more beneficial to um, keep my home, obviously, and rent it out? And is there any, do I have to re-qualify, I guess, is the real question, at uh, the prime plus the 2%? I'll let Frank answer the mortgage side to that, and then after he's done, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about the real estate side of that. Go ahead, Frank. For sure. So, so are you talking about buying a new house or transferring yeah. an existing mortgage? So. Well, either or, is there is there benefit to one versus the other? Uh, well, it depends. If you've got a really good mortgage rate, which many people have a better which interest do, yeah. rate now, yeah, which you do. So then, you know, your mortgage is portable. And if you're going up to another level, so then the way the qualifying would work is that they would take the payment based on your existing mortgage because that's fixed. Uh, and then they would, whatever new money you get, we have to qualify it at whatever rate we get you plus the two. So. Okay, that's the way you would have to qualify. So how can so, he do? How could he do that? And mortgage makes sense. How could he do that and write off more on the property that he wants to rent out? How can he write off? What do you mean, write off the interest? Well, he's going to need. He's going to need a mortgage for the new place, right? Yeah, and, the, and right, he has the, an he has an existing mortgage on this place, and so one's going to be rented. So where can you leave the money to give him the most benefit? Well, you would you would try and maximize the equity in your existing home if you're going to convert that one to a rental. So uh, we would take again, you know, in that case, you might want to leave that mortgage the way it is. Then we'll have to add to take some of the equity out, and then that mortgage. Technically, I mean, you could write off the interest. Although, if you take the money out and use it to buy a house you're moving into, you're not supposed to write off the interest on it. So, uh, but as far as qualifying, anybody that has an existing home wants to keep it as a rental and buy buys a new one. It's really difficult to qualify because, generally speaking, the rents don't cover uh, the cost of, of maintaining that property. So that's where it becomes a little tricky. Yeah, every circumstance is different. I mean, I'd have to have more information about you to tell you, yeah. to let you know whether whether you would fit in that category where you qualify. And and from the real estate side, first of all, you're in a CH Clement built home and I, I represent them in, in a lot of their subdivisions. So you're in a very, very well built home. I can tell you that. Um, 
Now, I've always preached keep as many doors as possible. Um, you know, like, so if you can afford to keep that as a rental and, and buy something else, I would love to see you do that. Keep that rental. The only thing I'm going to caution you right now is being a landlord today is a nightmare. Yeah, it is. No, a, no it, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. The tenants have all the rights and they know it and it's really, really hard. So if you are going to do that, my advice to you is make sure you get an amazing tenant, even if you have to leave it vacant for a month, but make sure your tenant is top notch. Now, if you're, yeah. if you're doing this in Russell will, and you're not cash flow positive, will the property appreciate enough to make it worth your while over time? Well, it, the, the it's already appreciated. I'm five years in and mortgage is coming up in it, November. Yeah. So you're, I mean, he's built up a lot of equity in that home. Um, but, but saying that as the, out, as you go further to the outskirts, the appreciation is slower than sort of when you're in the core, but yeah, it, take away the anomaly of the last five years. Yeah. But if you're also, as far as a rental, there's more people in the outskirts. There's more people looking to rent than there is people renting out property. So getting a tenant will be very, very easy for you. But like I mentioned, get a good tenant. You have to, because they're a nightmare to get out if the, if you don't get a good tenant. And easier to make the jump now, if I were just to sell in general, because the house just appreciated that much over the last five years Yeah. Is it, versus if I wait another, you know, three to five years, whatever rate I get, or don't worry about the rate. Well, I mean, first of all, if you're asking whether you should sell now or wait three to five years, <laughs> if it's going to be worth more, uh, I'm going to tell you in three to five years, your house is going to be worth more than it is right now. Just the way yeah. our mar- just the way our markets have gone. I mean, last year was the first time in, in since 1996 that our average sale price went downhill. So I don't anticipate that happening, you know, for quite a while again. So you're going to appreciate more if you keep it. Just know that if you put a tenant in there and you decide in three to five years that you want to sell that property, one, it's always really difficult with a tenant in there. And two, oh, sure. two, you might be spending money on renovations. But if your mortgage is due in November, you're in pretty good shape. Oh, yeah. Hence why we're looking well, at possibly wise, making that jump uh, to, to a yeah, single family. Equity wise, yeah, equity wise, you're in great shape because you've built up a whole bunch of equity. Uh, timing, better in November than in April and May, where a lot yeah. of Canadians have the mortgage coming up for renewal. Uh, they're not going to have as good a choice as you will in November when it comes to where interest rates are. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you. Thanks, Morgan. Hey, just before we uh, get on to birthdays, I just wanted to I wanted to mention that that two year extension now for the foreign home buyers is in. Yeah. So oh, they've extended it. I yeah. thought Paul would lead that with yeah. the show. I yeah. really was expecting Paul to say that's the first thing that comes out of his mouth when the show started. And you know what, though, I'm I'm happy with that. I'm yeah. ha- I'm happy with that because it would have been a nightmare for Canadians if they opened up the floodgates. And and listen, as a capital city, we're very affordable. Even though it's it's really us here in Ottawa, we're like, oh, this is not affordable. As a capital city, we're very affordable. And if they started opening up that foreign buyer ban and they take it away. You, we are going to get foreign money coming yeah. into Ottawa for sure. I mean, the, the, Toronto's kind of priced themselves out nowadays. You're going to see people coming into Montreal, Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa. And Ottawa's a, I mean, as a capital city, it's a beautiful city. And we're probably going to see a lot of foreign buyer money coming in. I'm glad they've extended it. Um, yeah. So we're good to until January 2027 at least. Yeah. So, which is good news, which is good news. Birthdays, Frank. Yeah, got a couple. Uh, of course, Mike, uh, my business partner, Mike Kopp. Happy celebrated his birthday this week, and next week on uh, on Wednesday, Terry celebrates her birthday. His wife, beautiful wife, who I've known longer than Mike. So happy birthday to Terry. Dorothy Smith from our office celebrating her birthday this coming week. Uh, my uh, uh, good family friend Franca Dinardo celebrated a milestone birthday. No numbers. So happy birthday to Franca and my son-in-law who's expecting my second grandchild with my beautiful daughter, Andrew, celebrating his birthday this week as well. So, uh, Frank, yeah. when, when you're your age, do you celebrate birthdays? <laughs> uh, nope, not at all. I have no <laughs> idea what my number is. It doesn't matter. I have one. Uh, Jason Craig, who's my rock star inside sales agent, uh, has been with me as of Tuesday, nine years. So happy anniversary at PRRE, Jason. Nice. None of your kids, Paul, have birthdays that you forgot about? No. <laughs> Well, apparently I almost forgot about Petra's son last week, but you know. None of the kids he wants to mention. (laughs) (laughs) And Frank, you know, you miss Petra. She's in the studio today. Of course she is. (laughs) Yeah, that's You only bring her in when I'm not there. I I know why, Paul, but that's okay. Yeah, it's because I can't trust you. (laughs) 
<laughs> and you were talking yeah. about new models before. That's who I thought you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You still got it. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Have a great week, folks. Have a great week. Have a great week. So, uh, and keep supporting local businesses and charities, everyone.